Uh, I'm calling from Oregon. Oregon. Oh, I see. So, uh, okay. north of Cal. I've been there. Yeah, it's very nice yeah. place. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm just trying to find to to check what's the time difference now. Okay. Uh, nine hours. Nine hours from Cairo. Okay, I see. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So I, I, I hope I'm heard. I don't know. Yes, yes, you are. Okay. Yes, I am. Yeah. Okay, okay. Because I'm here like, hello, <laughs> hello. Nice, nice. Hi, Tom. Hi, Natasha. Hi, Natasha. Today we are welcoming one of the most renowned Enneagram trainers, Tom Condon. Uh, Tom has worked with the Enneagram since 1980 and is accredited with honor by the International Enneagram Association. Also, we should say that Tom has worked with NLP and Ericksonian hypnosis since 1977. And he is a director of the Change Works in Oregon, USA. Uh, we know that Tom has taught over 800 workshops around the world. And thanks God, including Egypt. Uh, last year, we were lucky to welcome Tom, Tom with his amazing program, the, the Dynamic Enneagram Training, and this program was really life-changing. Life it was good and very, very uh, uh, productive, I would say, for coaches, for people who wanted to change their life, and inshallah, really, we will meet Tom soon here in Egypt again once the situation is becoming better. Tom is the author of 50 books, CDs oh. and DVDs on the Enneagram, NLP and Ericsson methods. And today, today Tom is with us uh, with the topic, the keys to changing and growing using the Enneagram. And we are really looking forward to hear about that and we, you will have a mic, Tom, in a second. Please, I will remind people, uh, let's not interrupt Tom. And if any question arises uh, during the speaking of Tom, please, you can either write it in the chat and we'll, uh, it will be answered later, or you can raise your hand and it will be answered also later. It will be called upon. Thank you very much. And Tom, please, the mic is yours. Well, thank you all for coming, and uh, I hope you're uh, uh, well and staying safe and staying as happy as you can. I wanted to talk a little bit about change today in relation to the Enneagram. Uh, as Natasha said, I have a background in NLP, which is, in the original way it was taught anyway, uh, really focused on change and also understanding the the elements of subjective experience. And I've found, I was involved with NLP for several years before I found its limitations, you might say. It's uh, deliberately about patterns and process, but it's not a really a good system for understanding the whole person. And then after a few years with NLP, I came across the Enneagram. I lived in Berkeley, California, where there were a lot of therapists who knew about it. And Helen Palmer was teaching early workshops. Uh, she used to have a, uh, a Thursday night workshop at the YMCA where she would um, do panels for, uh, it'd be a 10 week, 10 evening workshop. I went to one of those and that was helpful. But also I had a private practice in NLP and I was, learning about the Enneagram, a lot of it through my friends, uh, the therapist's friends who knew about it and who would smuggle me notes from courses. Like they would take a course with Claudio Naranjo or someone else who was teaching it. I'd, I'm not sure who else was teaching. Maybe, maybe course notes from Helen also, possibly. But um, 
I sat with those notes. The notes got, uh, it was a stack of notes. This was about 1981. And the notes, the notes got thicker and thicker. They were about four inches thick uh, when the books came out, which was about 1988. And what I sat with was trying to kind of merge in my own brain and behavior the methods of change that were uh, part, a big part of NLP, uh, along with understanding the Enneagram because the Enneagram takes time to understand. You have to take time to make it your own. And also it's a very good system for understanding a whole person or understanding major patterns in their life and in their behavior, uh, types of reactions that they've had over time. But it, in those days, it wasn't a very good system for there weren't any recommendations to speak of for growing and changing and you know getting over the excesses of your pattern getting over being caught in your pattern um, the two that were notable were uh, once you'd learned oh and also the the framework for the enneagram in those days was mostly negative because it was therapists and the therapists were all you know pretty focused on what was wrong in, a, in a, a client. And so you get these kind of discouraging but very powerful insights about the, the depth of someone's distortion and the way they generalize and the way they uh, get caught in their pattern and get in their own way. And not really a lot of solution except for two things. One was to meditate once you learned all these things about yourself, you really should meditate. And then the, the other one was whenever you can, if you notice a neurotic reaction or a, a reaction that reflects the excesses of your Enneagram style, then you really should stop it. Uh, just try and stop it. Just, just, just quit doing that. And uh, that'll make you better. And neither of those seem very sufficient to me as, as responses to something as profound as the Enneagram. And I did have NLP in my background, which was mostly about methods, methods of change, and then also uh, understanding the structure of subjective experience in terms of the senses. So how, if somebody is caught, for example, in their Enneagram style, what are they seeing? What are they hearing? What are they feeling? What are the what do they taste and smell? Where do they feel it in their body? Uh, is there an emotion that goes with it as well as a physical sensation? And the uh, the point of such questions is to get a person really immediately grounded in something that they can become aware of. It kind of works like a can opener, I find, with the with the Enneagram. It 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 helps open up the perspective that a person might otherwise be sort of locked into and uh, blind within. So this seemed like a natural marriage to me to bring together good techniques along with uh, a, a, a powerful diagnostic system for understanding the whole person and in doing that, I, I sat with it for a long time before I started to, to teach it, to, to teach what I discovered or what I knew. One of the things that comes from NLP, and this may be familiar to some of you who've been in my workshops, or I talked a little bit about this in uh, the conference in February in Cairo, is a model I like to use I call the five elements of change. And it's just a, a model for making change within yourself or making change with other people. When you know the Enneagram, you know a lot about uh, a client. If you're working with the client, you can kind of get, make educated guesses that work out very well usually. Uh, there's a difference between doing that and being just sort of uh, bigoted or you know, making snap judgments because you know there are one, therefore they are this. But 
it, once you know the the sort of rhythm of the pattern and the way it's structured and you know someone's central enneagram style and then the connections to other enneagram styles that are also part of the mixture you know they're like sides to someone's character those are uh very very useful you you uh friends of mine who are fishermen they say they you know have places that they go and love to fish because they know exactly where to fish and if you work with the Enneagram and you're working with other people and trying to help them, you know where to fish, but you also know where to fish within yourself for strengths and capacities and resources, as well as uh, illusions and kind of beliefs that, that trap you, that uh, make you a prisoner of your own model. So in talking about the, the elements of change, one of the first things that I focus on is defining what someone wants to change. Now, when you get involved with the Enneagram, there's a tendency to maybe overgeneralize at first. And, you know, you, there are some people, they learn the Enneagram, they say, well, I'd, I'd just like to be another number. You know, I'm, I'm a four, I'd like to be a seven, that sort of thing. But you're, you really can't change Enneagram styles that way, even over the course of a lifetime. But what you can change and what you can work on are the expressions of it that get in your way. And one of the ways that I understand the excesses of someone's Enneagram style and my own and in working with other people is that you're, you're overreacting in a way. It's a, it's a kind of defensive overreaction, a kind of way in which a person is um, reacting out of a picture of the world and a picture of themselves that's not necessarily up to date. It's not necessarily accurate. And a lot of times there will be kind of elements to it that are, uh, you know, where you're trying to help yourself. You know, somebody reacts in, somebody's an eight and they react in an aggressive way. Well, they're, you know, probably trying to, to protect some vulnerability in some way that historically used to work, in some way that used to be uh, the best choice possible. And beginning to define what you might want to change, but appreciating also that it has had a use anyway. You know, when you, if you're a six and you scare yourself routinely, that, that has some history that had a, a use in your history and was a compensation for something, or maybe a, a way of reacting that um, compensated for the fact that the, these things kept happening in your environment. You know, what, whatever happens to you the most when you're young is what you then start to sort of do to yourself. And you do it to yourself before anyone else can. You have some more control. You have a a kind of a, a picture of yourself that goes with it and assumptions about reality and the necessity of reacting that way. And then it, maybe it has something to do with a family role also. Uh, people will get into, you know, families create specialists. And when you're born into a family, there's, there may be a void in the family system that needs you to, to step into it. So, the family might need a hero or the family might need a, uh, somebody who screws up, who's the opposite of a hero, or the family might need a peacekeeper or the family might need a troublemaker. It, it depends on the family. But people will get pressed as children, they'll get pressed into service this way. And then that'll come out through the excesses of your Enneagram style, the, the way in which you uh, kind of react without choice many years later and people start to make connections that way uh, which i i find to be very useful the the beginning to realize that their current overreaction within their enneagram style has a history and has a sort of sequence to it and has a has a use and appreciating the fact that it has a use is also something we'll we'll talk about but in that use, 
you can begin to sort of recognize the that there's a, a part of you that's sort of been trapped in time and the you know doesn't know that it's 2020 and in 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 your reactions the the reactions can be a way to sort of manage old wounds or to feel in control like i said or to play a role in your family system that gets you love and appreciation uh, helps you sort of predict the future sometimes to anticipate what's going to happen next. This is all filtered through an Enneagram style. So when you're having the, the excessive reactions, which are the things that people most of the time want to work on or want to, to go beyond, want to, want to grow beyond, um, there, there is still a logic to it. Now, one of the things I really liked about NLP and that I've already mentioned is that it's uh, when you work on something, you, you, it's sensory based. And so you're really kind of focusing in on what a person is directly experiencing. If somebody says, well, I want to, uh, you know, I want to get over the, these reactions that I have within my Enneagram style so that I can get in touch with my essence, Someone who knows NLP would not assume they knew what you meant by the word essence. In other words, they would, uh, they would instead ask for, well, what would you see? What would you hear? What would you feel? What would you taste? What would you smell? And kind of uh, making it immediate, making it grounded in the senses, rather than having it be abstract. So it, it's kind of not very abstract as, as a way of working. Also, usually a person has to take some responsibility. Um, sometimes I remember when I would have a private practice, there'd be a couple that would come in and there'd be an eight and a two. And the eight would, they would sit down and the eight would say, I want you to change her. That's kind of a tall order. And usually what it's an indicator of in the eight is that there, there's a shadow or a, a a sense of frustration or a way in which they're, they're, they are overreacting, but they're blaming their overreaction on someone else or some outside source. And when you work with the Enneagram uh, with yourself or working with other people, it becomes kind of important to take as much as responsibility as you possibly can to assume that your reactions have some element of projection in them or your your, your Enneagram reactions or overreactions that have some way in which they're, they're uh, serving a purpose, but they're coming from you. They're coming from your personal unconscious. They're not falling from the sky. They're not destined. They're not, it's nothing like that. It's more of a, an unconscious strategy for maneuvering through reality and a way of uh, kind of, uh, understanding the world understanding yourself within your picture of the world but it's it's coming from you it's coming from the unconscious uh, a lot of times people will say well I, uh, the solution to this is just to become more conscious but actually most of the time when you're working with the excesses of an enneagram style or someone being caught in their pattern it's by definition unconscious it's, it's something that's, that's coming up without, without choice in a way that is uh, maybe confounding or contradictory to your conscious intentions. So then after uh, defining something that you want to change, uh, there's motivation. Uh, the motivation to change comes into it. And motivation is usually pretty important. You've got to be sort of sick of something or curious about something that is beyond your usual reaction, or uh, there, there needs to be a, an awareness of a cost. You know, it's sort of like you get to a point where going ahead and changing costs less than staying the same. And in doing that, you, you get at what they call in NLP secondary gains, someone's attachment to a problem. Uh, an attachment to a reaction. Uh, the eight who is covering up their vulnerability uh, by being aggressive or being forceful, they might 
really in some way when they thought about it realized that they didn't have another way to protect themselves. They hadn't learned another way or there had been other ways once in a while that had come up where they'd surprised themselves, but but really they'd fallen back on this sort of default strategy of being being strong and being tough. So beginning to recognize that there's an attachment uh, and an unconscious attachment. And that when people go to coaches or counselors or therapists, they're often saying, um, I want two things. I want to change and I want to stay the same. You know, uh, I want to stay the same because this has served me, you know, all through my life. They don't say it out loud, but that's, that's what they're saying in their body and their self-description. I want to um, maintain something that has served me, and yet at the same time, I'm sick of the excesses of it. And then they begin to realize, well, the, the thing that served me early in life, maybe in childhood, that's now the thing that's getting in my way. The, what once was a good solution is now the problem. What once was a, uh, a way of protecting myself is now a way of uh, kind of getting in, my own, getting in my own way and limiting my life, limiting my behavior and reactions. So they start to appreciate what an Enneagram style does. And this is quite useful, you know, to, to recognize, oh, there's a, you know, there's a sense to this thing. There's a, a logic to it. There's whatever, however else you might frame it in spiritual terms, in the personal unconscious terms, there's a, a way in which this is an adaptive strategy. And the adaptive part of it may be coming out now in kind of excessive ways, but at one time it was, it was the best choice possible. There's also in NLP a distinction I make uh, that are called it's called towards versus away from. And it's, these, are, these refer to motivations. And the away from motivation might be, uh, I, want to, I want to do this less. I want to stop being this way. I want to quit this behavior. I want to, uh, a six might say, uh, if I don't get over my anxiety, uh, I'm going to have to, my, my spouse will divorce me, something like that. And so there's a negative outcome that you're working against and you're, you're, you're trying not to be something, which actually is sort of impossible, but, but good try. And then there's also um, going towards and going towards is more like defining what you want instead, how you would like to be different. Uh, if you, if the, the therapist or the coach or the counselor or you could wave a magic wand and take away your Enneagram overreaction, then what would be left? How would you be functioning instead? How would you be uh, uh, reacting in a new way? There's also past examples of motivation. Uh, sometimes people start to realize, oh, well, you know, there's times in the past where I really made changes. And beginning to, beginning to identify whether those are present now or they could be present, you know, the, the kind of uh, intensity that might go with it. And then also we talk in workshops about different types of psychological defenses that run with different Enneagram styles. And I call them uh, feel good, feel bad, and feel nothing defenses. And what that means is <coughs> allergic cough. Uh, what that means is someone is a, a, a seven and they are trying to feel good and make themselves cheer themselves up when they experience a difficulty or a limitation or they get close to pain in themselves. And they, they, fanta, they posit a, a future. And then, uh, you know, the, the next the time after the pandemic, when they'll get to travel all over the world, and then they step into the fantasy. They step into the, the fantasy and make it present. And 
that's a kind of def a defense. It's a way of soothing yourself. It's a way of quieting your anxieties. It also relates to what they describe in sevens in terms of appetite. You know, a person could have an appetite for food or drink or uh, marijuana or uh, uh, new experiences, new information, new ideas. And there's a kind of escape from anxiety that is going on, but also the person feels better. Well, if a person feels, uh, if a person has a problem and then they make themselves feel better without changing the problem, that, that tends to mean that their defense is working against their desire to change. And I mentioned this also about nines, you know, the, a lot of nines will expect to live a long time. And if you think about that, uh, you think about having the expectation that you'll live to be 100, um, you know, why, why hurry to make a change today? You know, or if there's a conflict with someone or there, there's a, some, something that you want more from life, why, why rush into it? You know, you, you, maybe you have 40, 50, 60 more years. And so that will tend to subtract from motivation. Um, feel bad motivations sometimes they can be uh, sixes can have them uh, ones can have them fours can have them where they they attack themselves or they criticize themselves or they oppress themselves or they identify with their pain and so they you know they they feel a little worse rather than feel better when they're uh, having a reaction that ultimately they want to change and feel nothing defenses are sort of like, you know, you can think of a five going up into their head and living in the, the turret of their castle, so to speak, or uh, a nine again going numb, you know, giving themselves a, a sort of shot of anesthesia, that sort of thing. And so those, those defenses that are characteristic of, of specific Enneagram styles can sometimes enter into the mixture and be, um, if you're a, a coach or a counselor or a therapist, it's a good thing to be aware of. And if you're working on yourself and trying to uh, go beyond limitations, then beginning to, you know, self-observe and a lot of these other methods that they talk about in Enneagram circles can be really helpful that way. You start to recognize, oh, this is a kind of illusion that I'm uh, offering myself to make myself feel better or to make myself feel nothing or even to make myself feel bad. Is this clear so far? Well, I see a few nodding heads, but yes, I can only... Yes. Can only yeah, see it's, it's, it's clear. Of course, it's sad a little bit to know the truth, especially, for example, for six, yet, thank you yeah. very much. Yeah, it's a terrible thing. I'm sorry. Uh, Defining what you want instead, I kind of mentioned that already. Uh, stating a goal in positive terms uh, will make it more achievable. If you state it in negative terms, I want to stop being so self-critical, then that, that potentially can go on and on and on. And it, it usually doesn't work. It, it, oftentimes it'll reinforce the behavior that you're trying to change. But if you define something in the, in the positive, this is what I want instead. This is how I want to feel, make it sensory grounded. This is how I'd like to feel. This is how I'd like to, to move in my body. Uh, this is how I would like to see things. This is how I would like to, to sound. You know, maybe in, when I'm caught in my Enneagram pattern, I have a lot of internal dialogue and self-criticism. I would like instead to have a kind of quieter mind and maybe make gentle suggestions to myself and talk to myself in a calmer way, things like that. Um, sometimes you can, you can think about, well, when I'm reacting out of my Enneagram style, what, what would, what's the opposite of this in my experience? One of the things I like about the Enneagram, and, which wasn't present in the early days, and started with Don Rizzo and Russ Hudson, is that it's, there's really a spectrum that you can read about, that you can learn about 
from being really caught in the pattern and, and getting in your own way to being relatively free of the pattern and being effective and kind of in touch with your talents and your skills and your resources and your you know, sort of abilities that come more easily to you than they might come to other people. And being aware of that spectrum, then it kind of gives you, a, you know, something to sort of aim for, uh, how to, you know, how to keep working on yourself and growing and changing and manifesting the high side of your Enneagram style. And to me that I, when I first came across this, when I first came across the Enneagram, I thought, you know, this is like a lifetime homework assignment because there's a, a, a way in which you kind of return to the pattern periodically and maybe even struggle with the, the expressions of the pattern, but actually you're really not stepping into the same river twice. You know, uh, it can feel that way sometimes, like, you, oh, you know, I thought I had uh, vanquished self-criticism, you know, but, but here I am criticizing myself again but you might be doing it in a different way, in a different context, and it might have a different uh, uh, meaning in your life now than it once did. Um, sometimes people will talk about changes they wanna make that are real abstract. And um, sometimes they're esoteric, sometimes they're just sort of vague, but where the person is talking in a, a big sort of way, like, like I was saying before, someone says, well, I want to get in touch with my essence and manifest my essence all the time. That might be too big of a goal. Um, I've lived a number of decades now in, on earth and I haven't met too many people I thought were enlightened. Uh, but there is, there is talk in Enneagram circles that you'll come across sometimes about how a person wants to become an enlightened being and be recognized by, by others as such. And that's what we call an NLP, a big chunk. You know, uh, uh, that, in other words, it implies a whole other number of other changes and other uh, efforts. And, and it's, it's not necessarily wise to aim for something that is really, really big and abstract and not well-defined in terms of the senses. On the other hand, you can be you could be so focused on a tiny little thing that you get lost in that detail as well. And this, the, this is called chunking up and chunking down. And both of them have their advantages. In other words, when you, when you chunk up, you, if you're not doing it to you know, be abstract and try to become enlightened or, or uh, transcend yourself in some major way, you nevertheless could chunk up for inspiration, you know, sort of like this is part of uh, what I commit my life to is growing and changing and exploring and getting over things I was raised with and, and also whatever contribution I wanna to make to the world around me. Those are big chunks, but they're, they're inspiring big chunks. Also chunking up is good for looking, uh, gauging how far you've come and and maybe where you're, where you're headed for next. You know, it'd be like being on a, a long flat, walking on a long flat plain and then coming to a, a small mountain and you go up the mountain and you can see where you've come and you can see where you're going. So it's good for that. Also chunking down, what it's good for is taking steps, taking action, uh, doing something that is you know, involves putting one foot in front of another or uh, resolving some sort of situation in your life or uh, practicing a new habit or learning something new. Uh, all of those things are, you know, part of, they, they all require individual steps in order to, <coughs> in order to be, to actually have them happen. And somebody could chunk down too much and they could be obsessed with detail and get lost in the detail. They're trying to lose weight and so they weigh themselves every four hours, something like that. And when they do that, it, it tends, to, tends to get in the way. 
but chunking down otherwise involves, you know, taking taking steps that are necessary and taking action that's necessary in ways that are part of what you want to change and help you help you resolve what you want to change. So then there's uh, evoking inner resources. Now, when I first got involved with the Enneagram, uh, having a background in NLP, one of the things I thought was, well, this is not just a map of people's difficulties and their, their pitfalls and illusions and beliefs that they have that are distorted. It's also a map of their talents and abilities and resources and capacities things that come more naturally to them than to other people. And it was helpful to me to begin to contemplate and to focus on the high side of each Enneagram style, what each Enneagram style, you know, what the advantages are. Uh, you have within your Enneagram style, you have advantages that other people may not have or don't come so easily to other people in any case they can learn it it's not that there's built-in limitations but you know it's, a, it's sort of like talents and then the way i was taught the enneagram the way i use it there are wings the neighboring enneagram styles on either side and those have a high side uh and there are what they used to call stress and security points. I just call them connecting points at this, uh, in, at this time. Um, those all have a high side. Those were presented originally as one being bad and the other one being good, but that's not really too many people's experience unless they've uh, learned it that way and internalized it that way. But the people work with the Enneagram, for example, uh, never really quite believed it. So you have built-in connections to those two other styles. You have built-in connections to the wings. And then when I first came across the descriptions of the subtypes, they were all negative. And I thought, well, that can't be right because um, everything else is has a high side and a low side. All these other connections are dual aspected. And so one of the things I researched and thought about for a long time and made notes about was what are the advantages of having a dominant uh, subtype, a dominant instinct that you that you rely on. What are the what's the high side of the the other those other connections? Everybody has all three. Typically, there'll be one that they identify with more, but they have the other ones as well. So there are also other. Um, resources that are just common to human beings, things like uh, uh, moments of courage that you've had in your life, or uh, times when you you actually did make a change. That's, that's a resource. There was a, a way that you did it. There was a strategy that went into it. Also, um, sense of humor uh, sometimes really helps. It kind of implies that you can stand back from yourself and sort of witness your own behavior and, and you know, it's uh, recognize your own folly just as you recognize other people's folly, things like that. And all of those are strengths as well as the ability to learn. You know, there are some people, you, you can work with a five, for example. I worked with a five one time. He had no social skills to speak of. And it wasn't like he had hidden social skills somewhere in his unconscious. They just weren't there. But he was really good at learning. And so we, we got him a course. You know, we got him uh, books. We got him, we got him working on developing social skills and practicing them and developing the skill. And he was able to do that. That, that helped quite a bit. So things like that the ability to learn, and then having role models sometimes. If there is somebody that you know who maybe embodies a, a quality or a, uh, a kind of uh, behavior or a skill that you want to have for yourself, having a role model 
it can be kind of valuable, uh, kind of imitating them, kind of uh, like imagining what it would feel like to be them, what it would be like to to have that skill or have that quality, have that ability. And it becomes the foundation for your own version of that same quality or that same skill. That's, you know, how role models work. Children do it with uh, adults and people do it when they have mentors or they have somebody that they, uh, they admire. There are also um, shadows. And it's, it's a good thing to be aware of when you work with your own Enneagram style, you work with other people. There are sometimes typical shadows that somebody might ha uh, uh, manifest through their Enneagram style. An eight might, not, might dislike a three because the three is uh, preoccupied with image and spinning reality and the eight wants you know truth. They want, they don't, they don't want to be lied to. They want to, they want somebody to be honest, even if it's painful honest, that sort of thing. There can be shadow plays between different Enneagram styles. You see it in movies a lot, at least I did, where there would be a, a, a movie about a irrepressible seven, somebody who was really kind of wild and enthusiastic, and then the, they would be in conflict with a, 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 a one, somebody who looked like they'd just bit on a lemon and they're disapproving of the, the, uh, the seven's wild and excessive behavior, that sort of thing. There are shadows that you can see that way within the interplay between Enneagram styles, but then also there are personal shadows. People will start to recognize, oh, I'm trying to avoid a certain kind of person and it's based on my father or it's, you know, uh, based on something. It has, a, it has a consistency. And usually what a person is reacting to when the shadow is negative is they're reacting to the low side of someone else's Enneagram style. In other words, the eight is reacting to the three, but not the three when they're at their healthiest, but the three when they're kind of deceiving and kind of spinning and kind of putting on a false face for the world. So what they're not reacting to is the high side of three. And when, if you, if you're an eight and you start to, and you're, you're sort of doing this work, one of the things that you might be helped with by a coach or a therapist or a, a, a counselor of some sort is how to access the, the best of that Enneagram style rather than reacting to the worst of it. Also, people will have not only uh, wings and stress and security points and um, subtypes, they'll also have the Enneagram styles of their parents within them. Uh, even if the, the, those over, overlap or don't overlap with some of those other styles. My own style would be six. I'd be more counterphobic than phobic. I'd have a little more of a five wing than a seven wing, but it, they're almost equivalent. Uh, my father was an eight and my mother was a two. And according to the Enneagram, there's no built-in connection to those Enneagram styles. But I have a side of my character that's like an eight, it comes out sometimes, and a side of my character that's like a two, comes out when I work with people, for example. And that's a good thing to sort of realize as well. If you're in a, a negative tension to it, if you work on the, the, the negative reaction, um, you start to then access the high side. You know, you, you start to then be able to recognize, oh, this person has, or, or being this way has uh, a number of advantages, brings a number of, of talents and a number of capacities. It's a integrating a connection to eight or a six is a good thing. You know, it brings a kind of motive force and a kind of uh, uh, capacity to take action. You don't, you don't scare yourself as much, things like that. So those are both dark shadows and light shadows. In other words, a dark shadow is something that you avoid and a type of person that you, that you kind of react to. And when you know the Enneagram, you start to realize, oh, you know, I'm a, I'm a seven and they're all twos. 
you know, or all my ex-wives are twos, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> but, um, that that's quite helpful. But then light shadows are, uh, you know, people displaying behavior that you, or that you want to emulate, that you want to model, that you want to have for yourself. And the Enneagram will show you that sometimes too. Uh, at Enneagram conferences, not in Cairo, but at, uh, I've been to 30 of them over the years, you sometimes hear people saying things about Enneagram styles that they like and dislike, as if that was the point of learning about the Enneagram. And when they're talking that way, they'll say, you know, fours, I don't know what, you know, the, I don't know what fours want, you know, and sixes, they, they kind of get on my nerves. Uh, nines are lovely people. And uh, si of course, everybody loves sevens. Now, when a person is talking that way, they think they're talking about the Enneagram, but it's actually their unconscious mind confessing their character structure. They're, uh, they're kind of revealing what's uh, integrated within them and what's not integrated and what they aspire to and what they avoid. And they're talking about themselves. And that is a useful way to understand how people uh, talk once they've used the Enneagram, but also in your own thinking or your own work, just recognizing that they, if there are biases like that, that those are kind of juicy areas to explore or to get, uh, get to know and get, you know, get underneath the reaction rather than just continuing to have the reaction. Still making sense? At least yes, four, yes, it makes four, four of you think so. That's all I can say. No, all of us, all, all 50, all Hello, 51 of us. Hello, uh, all 47 of you. Yes, 50. Uh, We're 50. <laughs> you said 51. Yeah, okay. Um, so then. The last element is using good techniques, using good methods. And they, they come, they do different things. There are, uh, at this point, a number of methods that are attached to working with an Enneagram style. And then also, if you're, if you're interested in growing and changing, you may have exposed yourself to a number of techniques as well. And also, uh, if you've worked within what they call traditions within the Enneagram. Um, you might have been exposed to, a, you know, a basic technique that somebody teaches and offers that helps uh, maybe tamp down or quiet down the, the, the excesses of your Enneagram style. I find that these fall into uh, four categories. And this is kind of how I talk about it. And the last time we did a meeting, I talked about this as well in an indirect way. But one category might be, once you recognize your Enneagram style and kind of begin to sort of identify the, the negative elements in your reactions that you might want to change, uh, learning how to stand back from those reactions is sometimes helpful. And uh, Helen Palmer taught it this way for many years. She's added some other things now. But it, the, you know, the, the meditative practice, the, the, the standing back and witnessing your reactions and witnessing your behavior, rather than being inside of them and reacting without choice is, is one method. Developing an inner observer, um, you, you start to recognize the pattern, you start to catch yourself in the act. And in doing that, you, you have some distance on, on the problem rather than just simply acting out the problem each time. Also learning about the Enneagram, you know, when I first learned it, um, there was a point after a couple of years where I thought, well, I really, I really got a handle on this thing. I really understand it. And that same day, a new client would come through the door and I would be working with them and I would realize I, I, they were manifesting an Enneagram style in some way I 
didn't understand and had never seen before. And what I started to realize was that I was plateauing. In other words, I would learn for a while and then I would, you know, drop to a new level, learn for a while and drop to a new level. And that is a good thing to be aware of, that there's a tendency to, you know, think that you've really got your, your hands around something, but you, you, may, you may not understand it fully. And that it's a process. It's something that you maybe get used to uh, working with or maybe playing with like a kind of hobby or something like that, where you're, you, you retain your curiosity. I've worked with it for 40 years now, and I still find new things to observe or to sort of combine or put together or understand in a new way. Uh, if you go on Facebook or uh, uh, other social media, there's a lot of uh, ignorant discussions of Enneagram styles, and it's all about kind of superficial expressions, you know, what what Enneagram style breathes the most, you know, it's the, 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 there's a lot of stupid out there. And, but it's not just stupid, it's also kind of not realizing what the, 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 the model is about. It, it, it's like uh, taking human beings at their surface behavior, trying to categorize them. And it's a kind of defense, really. Uh, if it unless the person is just new to the Enneagram and so they're just clumsy with it. But uh, there are ways, to, it, it's good to keep in mind that you might have just plateaued and that there's always more to learn if you're interested in it. And that's more to learn about other people, but also more to learn about yourself. Standing back can also include uh, you know, the, the way in which you have discussions with other people, uh, if they're respectful, uh, where you, you know, where there's some exchange, there's some mutual understanding. Also, when people apply other models to the Enneagram, things that they already know, I did this with NLP, for example, it, it actually kind of opened up the Enneagram and kind of gave a different, uh, a different texture and a different function and purpose in a way. Then there's going against. Going against means trying to interrupt the pattern. It's kind of, uh, you know, standing back uh, goes with meditation, like I was talking about before in the early days where people were, it was recommended that people meditate and they stand back and become witnesses of their patterns. Uh, going against was also present in the early days where you're, you know, if you're, if you're, a one and you're judgmental, stop it, try and stop it. That kind of uh, sort of crude reaction, but there's also kind of subtler reactions that you can, and, and methods that are kind of helpful where you challenge yourself in some way to go beyond a limitation. If you're a, um, if you're a six and you have a phobia of riding in elevators, then you go ride elevators that kind of thing. Uh, you're, you're an eight and you're uh, vulnerable and you're trying to avoid your own vulnerability, then the assignment might be something like uh, go on YouTube and pick out three children's songs that make you cry. Or uh, a five might be encouraged to go out and do and uh, uh, contribute to charity and contribute time and energy or a skill or something like that. And in doing that, you're going against the pattern. But at the same time, it might be within the, the realm of possibility if you're tired of the, the excesses of the original pattern. Um, so go, there's going against, go, you, you start to, you're a four, you start to sink into a sad mood and you realize it and from maybe from standing back and then you get up and you go for a walk. You go out in nature somewhere. You do something that you know uh, can cheer you up or uh, help you in some way, 
or allows you to just sort of break out of the inner state that you otherwise would go into, which is already pretty familiar. It's already something that you've done in the past. So going against, then there's going with. Going with means you sink into a reaction, you, you embrace it. Uh, we have uh, William Blake, the poet, he said the road to wisdom, uh, the road of excess is the path to wisdom. And sometimes you can kind of take a reaction and intensify it, try and feel it in your body, um, you know, try to, to kind of amp it up and try to get at what we were talking about before. What is this, how am I trying to help myself? What is this doing for me? Or what is the, you know, if I really intensify it, what, what am I, how am I helping myself? And what is the, the unconscious logic behind it? And that will often kind of help. Um, you're not fighting it, you're going with it, you're, you're not uh, judging it, you're not uh, trying to stand back from it, you're not trying to uh, go against it. You, you just, you sink into the feeling, give it maybe full expression, uh, allow it to be, Sometimes feelings like that will then kind of go away or they'll modify or they'll, they'll reveal something else to you in a way that um, turns out to be useful. Turns out to be, it, it's sort of like appreciating what I was talking about before, appreciating the way in which something is trying to help you, even though it's uh, been getting in the way. And when you appreciate that, when you can really feel it, sometimes it'll, it turns into something else. And then there's going beyond, which involves things like um, having role models, like I was talking about before, imagining what you would like to have in your life in six months to a year, uh, focusing on uh, learning what you don't know, uh, teaching yourself new, new subjects or uh, teaching yourself about new aspects of reality that you've overlooked and uh, trying to sort of imagine what it would be like to be far beyond the excesses of your Enneagram style. And what, what, what would that involve? What would that uh, permit? Uh, what would that give you? Also meditation works this way sometimes as well, where you can, you know, you're opening up and opening up and just opening up for the, for the sake of opening up. Uh, kind of like deciding to go through life with fewer defenses. So that's a kind of summary of you know, what I wanted to talk about. Uh, and what, uh, uh, definitely some uh, other types that didn't hear uh, the against would be very interested uh, to, to see what can be done. Like you said, for type four, it would be going to the for a walk, like to break the state uh, for, for eight, you said, to listen and to cry, to be very vulnerable. What could you advise for some other types? Well, um, if you're a seven and you have too big of a book collection, throw 15% of it away. Tough. <laughs> Not a bad idea. Um, but also, uh, you know, a seven, you what you're working with, I think, is a, a way in which a part of the person feels like they're in jail, feels like they're trapped, feels like they're and the anxiety, there's an anxiety that goes with it. And they're trying to escape the anxiety through their defenses. But uh, beginning to sort of focus in on that and uh, identify any, it's usually in the emotions, it's located somewhere in someone's body, identify the part of you that feels like it's trapped or in jail already before you go into, say, a new situation that gradually turns into a jail. In other words, people will say, you know, I, I got this job and uh, at first I was excited, but then the job was boring and it just felt like a, a grind and it was going to last forever. And uh, that's, the, that, that's a trapped part of them talking. And that's sometimes pretty useful to, to pay attention to. Um, I don't know, with threes, 
uh, giving them assignments like uh, uh, play tennis with a friend of yours, but deliberately lose, but don't let them know. Uh, things like that, you know, get, uh, that's a going against sort of uh, pattern. But um, sometimes, you know, breaking up the, the, uh, the outer expression of, of the pattern. I mean, this is a, a really complicated area because I teach five day workshops and longer. And there's lots of methods and lots of techniques that are, that are useful. Uh, yeah. With an, you could, uh, I've had nines, and also I did this with twos. Um, go around, at least in the United States, go around to a, a store that sells appliances like large refrigerators, air conditioners, uh, or they could go actually uh, to uh, a place that sells automobiles. And no, it, it has to be something they don't want. And then they go and they let a salesperson try and sell them an automobile or a refrigerator. And then they say, thank you very much. No, thanks. I don't want it. And they get practice in saying no. Things like that. that that's helped with twos also. Um, like I've said in, I think in workshops, uh, uh, I've had twos go to a paper store and get a, a, a tablet of invoices and make out invoices to everyone in their life, uh, past and present. Uh, uh, specifying what the two has given the person and what the two is owed in, in return, things like that. Uh, you can't, don't send the invoices. It's just, <laughs> the exercise is for the two to sort of look at the dual nature of giving, that, that kind of thing. We have a one. Have what? Uh, we all just got cut off, I think. I didn't know that. That's not possible with Zoom, is it? Ah. Halid, can you move? Okay, uh, now I'm back. Yeah. I can hear you, Tom. Everybody's a little bit from, but yeah, I can hear you now. Oh, okay. Yeah, so we're back. To the internet, but it's back again, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 So what about the type one and type five? Well, um, you know, I mentioned with five, you know, doing things where you, you know, go against and volunteer your time and be generous. And um, also I've had fives who didn't have very good social skills. Uh, practice going around giving people compliments and they have to deliver them with a smile. Uh, or another five um, got invited to a party and I had him print out little uh, cards that said, I have laryngitis, so I can't talk tonight. So the five had to go to the party, sit in the party, but they couldn't say anything uh, just to intensify their defensive reaction, you know, to, to, to kind of, uh, flood themselves with it, going with, you would call it, I would call it. Um, with ones, you know, there are things like uh, working with a critical voice, learning how to uh, maybe modify their critical voice, uh, find out what it does for them, how it's trying to help them, but also things like uh, singing their self-criticism, uh, singing and dancing, if they have any kind of dancing in their background. Uh, and as they sing and dance their self-criticism, well, it's a lot harder to feel it in the usual way. You know, that, uh, that usually presupposes being kind of tense and frozen, you know, but if you're moving, the physiology of singing and dancing is quite a bit different. Uh, things that sort of break up the pattern or... Uh, Sometimes I'll have them listen to themselves and how many, how many things they say that are phrased in a negative way. You know, I don't do this, don't do that, I shouldn't have done this, that, that sort of thing. 
and then make a make a big list of them and then modify them flip it turn it into something how would you say this in a way that was that expressed what you want rather than what you don't want or sometimes uh or oh, there'd be generalizations that they might have and i would encourage them to to kind of write them down and and think about them and then find loopholes in their rules uh, to find uh, contradictions or uh, to find ways in which they are uh, you know they have they have a rule like this that say i must help my family no matter what and then the person begins to think about it and they realize well you know you could ask them well what if a family member is you know your 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 nephew is a dope dealer and uh, he wants you to bail him out, uh, spend money to bail him out of jail would you do that and then the one says well no but that's still been covered under the uh, umbrella belief of i must help my family so you're kind of breaking up the pattern in that way, you know, uh, find, going for counter examples, going for ways in which uh, somebody has a, a set of beliefs, but then there's contradictions to the beliefs. Anybody else, any questions? Well, that's a really heavy dose you gave us, Tom. It's like all these techniques and ways need months and years just to unfold and keep on working on i guess i'm sorry <laughs> no it's lovely actually it's a lot it's lovely and i hope people are taking notes and we'll be going over that it's uh, it's just magnificent those thank you so much and especially the last four that you gave by observing by going against by going with and what was the fourth one i'm sorry uh going beyond and going beyond pushing exactly. too much so, so all these are, are lovely to observe. So Natasha had dropped uh, out, but I think she's back in yes. again. I think I'm back. Yes, I'm back. I don't have yes, chat indeed. with me now. I don't see it yet. There was a, yes. Yes, there was a question from type three uh, that uh, uh, this person doesn't feel that uh, uh, she or he is doing as a type three. Something unex un unexpected is going on, which is a person is not achieving, is not moving too much. Is it normal? The question what was, is it normal? Normal. Um, I don't know. I, that's not enough to go on. There is a way in which sometimes threes reach a an impasse in their life or maybe you maybe three could be uh, frustrated by the pandemic and needing to shelter in place and they they can go to the low side of nine sometimes they still are pretty active but they go in circles it, it, it's their their reactions are not well thought out they're a little bit lost but it's so action oriented that they that they keep trying they keep doing stuff uh, I don't know, you know, or it may mean the person's a nine and they thought they were a three. I don't, you know, you, these things are really hard to, to know on their surface. Thank you. Yeah, I guess Thank from, from behavior, uh, it's not easy to tell exactly what's going on. It needs to go beyond that. No, when, when two people do the same thing, it's not the same thing at all. You know, there, it presupposes a whole uh, hmm. layer of motivation and personal history and unique identity and uh, how a person has adapted, how they've, how they've uh, defended themselves, what their strengths are, all kinds of stuff. So it's, it's worth knowing that in people you work with and also knowing that within yourself too, beginning to kind of think about, well, you know, I, how do I do this, you know, or you know, kind of, kind of a combination of self-questioning and then also what I would hope to put across in a demonstration or a, a talk like this is that the Enneagram can be used in a really dynamic way and it's better to approach the system dynamically rather than to talk about it in terms of types even. 
uh, a type is, in English anyway, a type is a frozen thing. It's an object, and an object, uh, a permanent object. And a lot of times it's more useful to kind of approach working with your own or other people's Enneagram styles as, well, these are strategies for making sense of reality. It's a gen genuine discovery. And uh, I think it's, you know, the more you work with it, the more you're struck by how, how smart it is and how deep it is. But it's also got to do with a way in which, you know, a, a person has adapted within their life and, and uh, ways in which they are actively generating this thing from an unconscious level. It's not like you, it fell from the sky and you are, you know, frozen in your, your type. It's more like something that you're doing rather than something that you are. It's more like a verb than a noun. And as such, it's something that you can really work with profitably and uh, grow and change and go beyond old limits and uh, surprise yourself and have a more complete life. Hello, Tom? Yeah. Still here? Oh. Yes, yes. I, I hear you. Yeah. No, I don't. Well, uh, that's because I wasn't talking. Tom? Ah, okay. So, it seems uh, we're, things are dropping and coming back. Something's happening on the internet. Okay. Natasha, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we hear you well. Okay, Tom. And uh, the question, another question that came through chat is uh, how can type four make a smooth and positive change? Would you give any advice? Well, my friend Russ Hudson would say uh, the number one thing is that if you're a four and you want to grow and change, you have to give up the fantasy. Now that's a going against. Uh, I, I find fours are sometimes motivated to change because they are bored, because their fantasies are always the same. They always end the same. They always have the same plot. You know, it's like Hollywood movies that always have the same plot. And it kind of depends on the individual, what they want and how attached they are. Uh, they might have to kind of get in touch with what they're holding on to or how they're identified with their pain. You know, I am my pain and how it's a kind of identity. But also uh, boredom sometimes comes into it. Also uh, a kind of desire to reach out and help other people and uh, do something that is useful or um, uh, kind of reduces pain in the world around them, or also sometimes having a um, uh, forms of self-expression. Uh, the, there are obvious ones like uh, writing in a journal or uh, uh, using watercolors to paint or things like that, making music in some ways, but they're not all artistic. You can also kind of give a sort of form to your life and make it more interesting in some ways or, or creatively satisfying. The story I tell is about a, a, a friend of mine in the uh, mountains in California. There was a, there is a, uh, uh, an old town that was created during the gold rush in, Cal in California. And that was in the 1840s, which to an American is a long time. And they've preserved some of this town so that the hotel is the way it was back in the day. And the, um, the, you know, some of the stores also, you know, they sell souvenirs, but they're also uh, original. And my friend was the, the night manager at the hotel that was built in the 1840s. And he got, he got bored, and at a, a certain point, one thing that he did 
And a lot of fours will do this. They'll kind of improve or, or make more interesting and dull job. In his case, what he did was he um, passed around a rumor that the, the hotel was haunted. And he would tell the, the ghost, uh, the people who, when they checked in, that the hotel was haunted. And then he, the, the other part of the rumor was that if you leave a bottle of wine outside your room at night, the ghosts won't bother you. And he got a lot of wine out of it. Uh, another four that I knew of was a painter and he had to travel on business. And when he would go into a hotel, he would uh, take one of the boring uh, paintings that they have in hotels and he would, he would take it out of its frame and he would add bizarre funny little details to it. So there would be a, a picture of a, a marsh with ducks flying over it, you know, and some mountains in the background. And then what he would add, he'd add little trolls. And the trolls would be down underneath a bridge shooting at the ducks, you know, and laughing. And then he'd, he'd very carefully put it back in its frame and put it back on the, on the wall. And very much enjoy the thought of, someone noticing it in the future. But he, trying, to, trying to kind of be creative within an uncreative context. That's amazing. Okay, somebody, <clears throat> uh, somebody got also inspired by that question. And uh, the same question comes from type six. How can type six make a smooth and positive change? Everybody wants it. Well, usually with sixes, you know, the tendency is to scare yourself when you're caught in the pattern of it. This was something that had its use back in the early on. I'm a six, I grew up around Irish alcoholics. And when someone would take a drink, you'd start to mentally try to predict the weather in the household because there could be a really crazy, stupid argument in you know, 25 minutes once the alcohols, you know, started to take effect. And so when you, when you're older and you're sc still scaring yourself in order to be safe, the paradox of that starts to hit you. And uh, you, you start to realize what you're doing. One of the things you can do with fears like that is to exaggerate them or view them through a microscope. You can, uh, uh, kind of, kind of, either way is useful. So exaggerating a fear is, you know, someone says, "I'm afraid to ask for more money at work because my boss might fire me," and then the person, the six, scares themselves with that, but they stop there. But if you keep going you can get really, really exaggerated and, and far out in space, you know, and uh, in doing that, sometimes it, it actually makes the fear evaporate after a while. So your boss scares you or uh, you ask for a raise, your boss fires you, then you're out on the street, then you, you starve to death, then you're, you're out in space because you've died and you're in this uh, void and there's a giant uh, horrible beast that uh, uh, eats the, the bodies of the recently dead. And I did this one time with someone and he, he came up with uh, this, this horrible cosmic beast and it, was, uh, it devoured him and turned him into atoms and molecules. And at a certain point I asked him, well, how do you feel? And he said, peaceful. And it was sort of like he kind of exaggerated it to its, uh, to its extreme. And sometimes that'll, that'll help. Sometimes things will become funny too. And then the other one is uh, kind of getting very specific and very uh, particular about what exactly it is that you're afraid of. It's not you know, it's not some general thing. It's something in particular, something specific, something in that uh, conversation you had with somebody earlier in the day or 
some other sort of situation or a challenge and you don't know what what to do and so you scare yourself and then you know you you start to pinpoint it and you start to get really specific in particular and a lot of times a person will arrive at a point where they say oh well i can i can do that you know you chunk it down so chunking up and chunking down uh, both of those are kind of uh, helpful at certain times. Thank you, thank you, Tom. It's like Tom is always saying to type to, to me when I'm excited and anxious, it will be much worse <laughs> than you imagine, and it it's helps. Humor <laughs> somehow, humor helps. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Uh, I see many other questions. Uh, yes, there was. Um, uh, one course. question there was, uh, I'm sorry, Khalid, uh, was about recommendations of books or lectures that uh, we can read, we can search up, or, or maybe you have your uh, websites or something? Or well, my website <clears throat> is thechangeworks, all one word, dot com. And I have uh, things for downloads. I've uh, recorded Enneagram workshops and uh, a couple of books and a lot of stuff. And I must say, I highly recommend uh, Tom's courses and Tom's uh, audios, and you can just find them on his website. I have personally learned so much from them. I mean, they have been the thing that I rel relied on a lot when I first started learning the Enneagram, and they excelled my learning into the Enneagram world. So I, I recommend everyone to just go on the website, and you'll find lots of magnificent uh, uh, CDs and, and, and courses there. And also Tom, when he comes to Egypt, he brings uh, a lot of these with him too. So uh, when Tom is in Egypt, recommend his course and we recommend his, uh, his material. And UC has just put the website on the chat. So anyone interested, you can check the website from UC down there. So, Tom, many other people are asking about the types, but I think we're not going to go through all nine types. So we've had, I think, I mean, the first two who asked, they got their chance, the four and the six. And uh, we, we can leave the others to, to another, uh, another opportunity. And maybe I'll just ask one last question uh, uh, before Natasha can, can close this. Uh, you, you mentioned a very interesting point, which actually was one of my... Um, first realizations when I entered the world of the Enneagram, which was about the subtypes and how, even though lots of work has been done about the high and the low sides of the types, uh, starting, I believe, from, uh, Don, uh, from Rizzo's, uh, Don Rizzo's work and then lots of others after that, yet nothing was done about the subtypes. And you have been putting out some of these and you've been promising also something comprehensive. So, can you give us something briefly about at least the three subtypes on the high, uh, the three instincts on the high side, and when do we expect to see something out coming out from you, uh, comprehensive about the high and low side of the subtypes? What did I promise? I, I don't yeah, I, maybe I'm maybe I'm putting this on you now. It's time that someone like you uh -oh, bring out something for the six. comprehensive about the subtypes on the high and low sides because there's too much on the low side and we really have to dig for the high side. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't make any sense because it's like saying uh, someone's central Enneagram style is just a set of limitations. Yeah. That's not how it works. And on the high side, of, I'll give you a preview of this thing that I apparently have agreed to do. Uh, <laughs> Um, on the high side of like, if somebody's very focused on self-preservation, they can be really good with detail. They take care of business. They can be really effective in a worldly sense. Um, there's, there's a lot to it that way that is um, helpful to, to tap into. And even if you're not, uh, you know, even if you identify more with one of the other subtypes, you know, focusing on that aspect of self-preservation, there's a talent in there somewhere. Uh, if somebody's fundamentally social, although you really are all three, um, it's just kind of a, a convenient way to talk, to say somebody's a social subtype. 
although they could be more preoccupied with it and more return to it more often. Uh, you can feel like your, your well-being is the same as the group's well-being, you know, that, you're, uh, that you, you, you want to contribute to the world around you, you have causes and you have things that matter to you that, um, that you want to um, make a difference about and maybe they help other people, maybe they make things better in some way. Uh, you can be, you know, just sort of feel like you're, uh, there's a Buddhist saying about this, no one will be enlightened until everyone's enlightened. Uh, no, I won't be enlightened until everyone's enlightened. But it, it, it's sort of that idea. You have a kind of a group in your head and that comes to you more easily. And with the intimate subtype, you can, you can make a, one-to-one -one connections with people that are very deep and meaningful and have a lot of layers to them. You can recognize people's individuality and uniqueness. You don't really compare them to anybody else. They are who they are and you get that. And there's a, you know, a deeply satisfying quality to your connections with them, that sort of thing. And then also they talk about it in terms of mating and sexuality and things like that. But I find for myself that the uh, like a, an intimate subtype or a one-to-one -one subtype, whatever you want to call it, that there it shapes your thoughts and it shapes your motivate and it shapes your motivations and shapes your feelings. And the shape of your thoughts really has it has to do with one other person at a time. Uh, just just as with the social subtype, the shape of your thoughts, it has to do with a group. And maybe there are, you know, particular individuals, but you're not, not an inherent limitation, but you tend to kind of think in terms of groups. And each of those has a high, each subtype has a high side and a low side. And, you know, they do talk about the, the low side, uh, somebody's too social, they get lost in you know, interacting with people. Somebody's too uh, focused on one-to-one, -one, intimate, then they get uh, uh, jealous and possessive and you know, uh, uh, their feelings get hurt easily, things like that. And somebody's too focused on self-preservation, then there's no, there's no art, there's no love, there's just surviving, you know, that kind of thing. And certainly the pandemic has been bringing out the self-preservation in people, you know, and everybody's, everybody's got some. So I'll look forward to hearing when this uh, is presented. Actually, on your, web, on your website, I describe, uh, or on, the, on your Facebook feed, on the Facebook I describe at once today. Yeah. Yeah. The little yeah. Thing. yeah, actually, these are the, the, the little things you're bringing out that I that I'm expecting that you should you're going to compile them all together. They're so lovely, and they're directly going in, and you show the high side of all these subtypes. So, uh, I mean, we're waiting, just like you are waiting to hear about it. We're waiting to hear about it when you compile them all. Yeah. Yes, oh. we will. <laughs> we will hear it once. <laughs> I'm lucky that uh, the time sense in Egyptian, Egypt is so long. Yes. It means you can wait. <laughs> what do you call yes. it in NLP? There's through time and there's about time. I remember there were these expressions about time in NLP. There's in time, through time, and between times. Yeah. Yeah. And in Egypt, which one would we be? What type of time do we have? Or a, or a fourth one altogether. It, it it would have more to do with a timeline, uh, a sense of how uh, of how how long it is between your current age and the age of eighty. Let's say that's mm -hmm. how it plays in a personal way. Uh, I was talking about it before within in relation to nines. Nines will have long timelines, and then they'll be. They'll be 50, but they're going to live to be 110. So there's no, there's no you know, it takes away vacation. Right. And I've heard people in my limited experience in Egypt, uh, you know, referring to the pharaohs. 
And that friend of mine who worked in the hotel that was built in 1849, that's, that's a long time to an American. Yeah. The whole history. Thank you, Tom, very much. And uh, uh, again, uh, Tom is posting all the time the, his articles and the, maybe some parts of the book that is coming on the Enneagram Egypt community on Facebook. It's really amazing and it's opening so many and uh, so many points and explaining so many things. So thank okay. you very much, Tom, today for being with us. And uh, we really, really appreciate you from to talk to you're talking to us from far, far west to our very, very, very east. <laughs> and we wish you good health these days, all of us, all the community. And we really appreciate your wisdom today sharing with us. Thank you yeah. all also for coming. Thank you Thanks. very much. Thanks to Thank everyone. Stay safe and be well. You too. Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.